Welcome to episode 26 of the Blackadder podcast. We are, none of our rods are on display and there are only a few Turkish whores who can testify to their... Yes, okay. <laughs> how are you? I'm not too bad, Jerry. How are you this week? Not too bad, Ian. Thanks for asking. Excellent. You're looking forward to this, the, the final episode of... Blackadder. Well, the final episode proper, we still have next week to cover back and forth. We do, and it, it's in no way the final episode of Blackadder because there were three further seasons where they're not. Apparently. Yes. I'm going to be very serious about it. I've been told that I should keep up my poor face humorouslessness. <laughs> they might not have meant it, but... <laughs> I think they did. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... Um, this season hasn't been one that would um, necessarily change a, a, a poor face to a, a happy face. Well, here's a question. If they never made the rest of Blackadder, would this season have become like a cult classic or do you think it would have been forgotten? Forgotten. Yeah. And I said before, I think that if this was produced today, there's no chance you would be commissioned for a second season. Yeah, but there's still threads that get picked up and there's bits and pieces that lead into what we particularly enjoying the later mm -hmm. seasons. That's true. Will we begin with this week's review? Well, I suppose it's a, a reasonable thing to do, given that is the, the purpose of the podcast. Summary? Sure. Crack on. In the Black Seal, we find a different Prince Edmund, one driven to the end of his tether by a lack of recognition from his father. Determining that he must show his true qualities, the Black Adder dispenses with the aid of Baldric and Lord Percy, looking instead to build a team of supervillains. When the time comes to execute their vision, the vicious Philip of Burgundy stands between Edmund and the throne. But will things work out as badly as usual, or is Edmund's long wait finally over? Thank you, Ian. That sealed it there. <laughs> it's an odd... You mentioned in your... Summary there. Um, an odd move to ditch most of the supporting cast for yes. this final episode. I agree. We talked, I think, in the previous episode about the sidelining of Brian Blessed's character, which had been one of the strongest parts of the series through the first four episodes. And then in this one, we basically lose Percy, who again has been very well um, delivered by Tim McInerney and Baldrick, who of course goes on to be very popular in the future. So it's a interesting choice. I'd like to know, I've not been able to find any information about why this decision was made. Mm -hmm. If there was anything beyond this is a good idea for a story um, or is it just, you know, we want to showcase this is our own Atkinson showcase. We want to put this out here. Final episode, it's all about his character. Don't know. Perhaps someone can tell us. Well, the one thing that I did read is that there was a previous version of the script which involved Percy and Baldrick a bit more realising that they'd been um, fooled by Burgundy but they didn't go with that one mm. Okay As per usual we begin with a scroll and some narration What do we find out here? I think yeah, it's a historical look back at um, the Black Adder and the many tales that are told of him and Percy and Baldrick, son of Robin the Dung Gatherer but the most popular one of those is the final chapter this one We then have the credits and another on screen narration Info blast, as we find out it is St Juniper's Day, a day when the king lavishes honours upon his kinfolk. He does. So that's where we are, at the castle court. I never know what this area is called, it's a main hall. I've got it as Great Hall, but I don't yeah. know if it's out of Harry Potter or something. It's probably a sure. technical term for it, but I don't know. Did you like all the, the titles that Harry received from his father? Remind me. Captain of the Guard, mm -hmm. really, really standard one there. Grand Warden of the Northern and Eastern Marches. Not Fair. bad. Yeah. Chief Lunatic of the Duchy of Gloucester. Like it. 
Viceroy of Wales. Not so much. Sheriff of Nottingham. That's the one for me. <laughs> Marquis of the Midlands. Mm. And I think one of them was Harbinger of the Doomed Rat. Not bad. I'd take that. What does it mean? No idea. I think it's just an ominous title that you can intimidate people with. Yeah. I like it. Edmund, though, does not. We see while these are being reeled off, there was maybe one or two that he was hoping for. Paraphrasing St. Juniper, as we heard at the top of the podcast, the king discusses his rod before he acknowledges his two sons. He does. Harry and... The other one, I think, <laughs> is what he goes with this time. Yeah, before asking Harry himself to step forward to be given the vastity of titles that you mentioned there. He then calls for the other one. Yeah, and he compounds his disappointment by not only not having additional titles for him, but by removing the one title he had that was worth having. Yeah, the Dukedom of Edinburgh. When Blackadder moved forward, he'd done that in a very overtly campy sort of way. I'm not sure why he started walking like that. I think it's traditional to prostrate yourself before the king. No, I mean the actual walk up and to it. Yeah, I don't think Harry did that, did he? No. He maybe just thought it would um, curry favour. Yeah. Anyway, at this, the king and his entourage depart to Stoke, I think it is. It's rebellious Stoke. In order to honour someone by showing them his bare buttocks. Well, the whole city, I think. Oh. I'm just going to tell them that that's what they came for. Yeah, seeing Brian Blessed's bare buttocks would be a, an honour. It would lead to the immediate surrender, I think. Mm. So now alone with Percy and Baldrick, Blackadder decides enough is enough and chooses to make some drastic changes in his life. I must clear away the chaff from my life and let shine forth the true wheat of greatness. Do it at once, my lord. Very well. Percy, you are dismissed from my service. <laughs> Me? What? Because, Percy, far from being a fit consort for a prince of the realm, you would bore the leggings off a village idiot. You ride a horse rather less well than another horse would. Your brain would make a grain of sand look large and ungainly. And the part of you that can't be mentioned, I'm reliably informed by women around the court, wouldn't be worth mentioning even if it could be. <laughs> if you put on a floppy hat and a furry codpiece, you might just get by as a fool. But since you wouldn't know a joke if it got up and gave you a haircut, I doubt it. That is why you're dismissed. Oh, I see. And as for you, Baldrick, my lord, you're out too. We get another scroll. We do. As Edmund heads to the gates of the castle, it says, So Edmund spurned his friends and began his quest for glory. Yeah. He had a wee friendly chat with Baldrick, though, before they part. Yeah, Baldrick is lamenting his job of shoveling dung. And he thinks he will have to resort to cleaning out the lepers or something. Yeah, he's going to milk the pigs or uh, muck out the lepers because it takes years to work up to a, a dung shoveling role. And as Blackadder rides off, Baldrick wipes some tears from his eyes. There seems a genuine... I don't know if he's um, crying over the loss of the position that he was in. Or his friend leaving. Yeah. Do you think they really were friends? Well, they certainly... Baldrick's life revolved around Edmund, didn't it? That was his role. Yeah, but that could be a master-servant relationship. You're not friends. Could be. Who knows? Mm. Open to interpretation, perhaps. However, after only about 100 yards of this quest... He is approached by an old man. A retired man. A retired Morris dancing man. Who wishes employment by tending his horse. Absolutely, but Edmund is not in the least bit interested. No, thinking himself smart, Blackadder says that if he can keep up, he can join him. And then he immediately gallops off. This is a very Python-esque, but we've mentioned this before. There's a, a heavy Python influence in this series. Um, so Edmund is riding out on his horse and this old man go goes by on a donkey at double the speed. <laughs> was it a do I thought it was a rocking horse or something. Oh, it was something, it was either, a, a, I'm not sure. It's something that shouldn't be travelling at that speed. Certainly a very small animal slash stuffed animal, <laughs> yes. There's another caption at this point, but I didn't write it down because I got fed up writing down all the captions. Did you write down some of them? Mm, yeah, I've got one more. Okay. We're now in the countryside. And another with, caption. <laughs> yes. With uh, more text, we are told Blackadder is searching for the six 
most evil men in the land. The six other most evil men in the land. So he classes himself as... Amongst the most evil men, yes. Uh, would you agree? No. It's a bit nasty. I'm not sure. Yeah. Evil. He reminds me, if anyone's seen the, the most recent Ghostbusters movie... He reminds me of the bad guy in that who thinks he's evil, but he's just a bit of a wuss. Mm -hmm. Not seen it. Quite fancy it, mind you. It's good. Yeah. Anyway, the first of these evil men that Blackadder comes across is Sir Wilfred Death, who Blackadder watches fight off two armed soldiers who I think are attempting to bring him to justice. I thought it was three and they had hoods on, so I'm not sure whether they're just vigilantes or if they are indeed um, other slightly less evil men wanting on his patch no i think they might be representing the the law for want of a better word okay. whether it be the the king or the the sheriffs or whoever they, th they threatened to string him up by his coddling mm -hmm. but um, in an off-screen scuffle he defeats all three of them and instead strings them up by their coddlings from the tree blackadder shakes hands with him and informs him of his plan he's looking for men to take over the kingdom and death accepts this offer and joins his band of one. Yes, it's now two. There's a lot of um, finger-based number gesturing in this episode, which I don't think we really need to narrate. No, who do we come to next? Three-fingered Pete. <laughs> in a field. What's he doing? He's staging an archery contest with another man over a horse. I think the other man takes uh, his shot first. Yes, it's a perfect shot right down the middle. Looks like it, yeah. But Pete has a plan. What's that? Instead of shooting the target, he shoots the other man. You saw that coming, didn't you? I did, that's why I set that up to rhyme. Okay. And he joins the team. He too is happy to take part in this quest. After Pete, who do we meet? Guy de Glastonbury. A highwayman whose cry is your money and your life. It <laughs> is, although he misspeaks on the first occasion we meet him. He seems to have a, an arrangement with the carriage driver who passes his way conveniently. And so three become four. Yes, but Wilfred indicates at this stage there is one characteristic that they require. Yes, they need a, a real bastard. Yes. Should have brought Baldrick. Yeah. <laughs> so who does Pete suggest? Sean, the Irish bastard. Okay. So over to a village we head, where we see Sean acting like a bastard by doing what? Well, it looks like he's following somebody, but then he notices a blind beggar and stops to steal all his money. He does indeed, before he in turn joins the motley crew. The blind men make a, a little joke, not deliberately, but they, they refer to it being quiet this morning, but they're out in the middle of the night, the joke being they don't know because they're blind. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> From the village we head to the forest. We do, to recruit Friar Bellows. Yeah, I think he's the most evil of all men. Yeah, he's approached by a father who's worried about his daughter's chastity, mm -hmm. and he asks for the friar's help. What help is that? I don't know, because the next time we do, we see him pumping her in the woods. <laughs> yes, he is administering extreme unction on this young virgin. Yes, I think that's um, solved the problem. Yep, her chastity is no longer it's a worry. An issue, no. <laughs> and he joins the team. <laughs> that leaves just one more spot. Yes, they still have to add a final member to their number. And they guess at who it might be. Who shall be our seventh, Wolford? Why need I say? Jack. <laughs> Not mad bully boy Jack, a grave robbing assassin of Aldwych. No. Then crazed animal Jack, the cattle rustling cannibal from Sutton Coffee. <laughs> no. Then your man Saint Jack O'Hooligan, the man hating goat murderer of Dingle Bay. No. <laughs> Surely not Canon Jack Smollett, the senior archdeacon of the Diocese of St. Botar, the entry eating heretic of Barton Well. No. I'm talking of unspeakably violent Jack, the bull buggering beast killer of the fixed world. Are you sure he's the kind of chap we're looking for? Yes. <laughs> Did you have a favourite in that list? Well, I like the reference to Bath and Wales. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's one that was picked up very quickly in season two. It was. I think he's been mentioned a few times. Uh, yeah, I think it's a recurring, thread, yeah. a recurring idea, yes. Yeah, so at the end of that clip, we see large Jack walk up the hill towards the gang, followed by a much smaller person who's trying to fight him. I think you're getting mixed up there, Jerry. 
Jack's the wee guy. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so you, uh, now you know because I've just told you. The wee man is lifted up and he sticks the head on the large fellow. I believe so. Um, he renders him unable to fight any further. Yeah, and he rides off with the team. He does. To an inn. Or a pub. An inn. Okay. Back in those days. A didn't. watering hole. An inn. <laughs> an inn. An inn. An inn. An inn. An inn. An inn. They are sitting around telling stories of their sexual conquests and Blackadder looks uncomfortable at this. Yeah, I think he wants to gather some attention back to himself. And how does he do that? He starts trying to... I think he's trying to ingratiate himself with Jack. Mm -hmm. He tries to give him a, a wee nickname. What's that? Or a large nickname, as the case may be. Well, he asks Jack his surname. His surname is Large. Mm -hmm. So Edmund wants to call him Large Jack. And that upsets Jack. Yeah, so I think Blackadder changes his mind and says, okay, we'll call you Little Jack. He isn't like that either. No. Jack went all Joe Pesky here, I think, in Goodfellas. <laughs> no, I thought you meant Joe Pesky when anyone talks to him in the street. But yes, no, he doesn't want to be called large because he's not large. He doesn't want to be called little because that's taking the mic out of him for being wee. Yeah, I think probably a, a nickname. That doesn't refer to his size. Yeah. yeah. But it's a playing Little John, isn't it? Of course. In any case, to change the mood, Blackadder orders six large beers and another large beer <laughs> before getting down to discussing the plan. See, this is... We've talked in the past about jokes that didn't work in this mm -hmm. series and that's obviously why we get called po-faced anti-humorous listeners, miss. But <laughs> and that, this is, is, that, is that an hygiene? It really has. But <laughs> this is an instance where you've got a short person in the scene but he's not the butt of the humour there's jokes that relate to his size yeah. but we're not laughing at him and it's done much better and it works really well and I quite enjoyed this scene mm -hmm. the gang however are more interested in slaughtering the meek and flowers before the, the friar orders silence so that Blackadder can set them straight Edmund disappoints them though by saying that the plan is simple yes they thought it would be cunning <laughs> Yes, appropriately so. Yeah, so he rephrases it to being cunning in its simplicity. <laughs> Absolutely. He's going home and they're going to do nothing. Yes, I think he says he will send them a, a message or a sign when the time's right. They want to strike now though, but well, the iron is hot. Yeah, but I think he persuades them when they sit and they ask what this sign will be. And he tells them something black probably, but not black pudding or the uh, black plague. <laughs> Yes, because they think he's trying to kill them at that <laughs> stage. They go with a black-haired messenger. And when they receive this messenger, they should all meet at Jasper's Tavern. Or inn, as you would call it. Mm -hmm. And from there, they will capture the king, queen and Harry and exile them. Again, that doesn't go down so well. Is a tavern different from an inn, I think? An inn might, be, uh, might have rooms. A tavern is just a, a Poss boozer. Possibly. They might have become interchangeable over the years, I guess. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Wikipedia probably knows. Somebody knows. Someone's going to be anal about it and, and it doesn't matter. The group want to kill the king and the queen and Harry and Edmund isn't too fussed about arguing that point. No, so he sort of agrees. I mean, I think he's just trying to ignore it at this point. Yeah, and he gives them their, his personal assurance that this is not actually a convoluted plot to kill them all. They are, yes, and they ask why they should believe him. And he tells them because the Black Adder gives his word. But he has to explain that he is a black adder. Yes, it's not as smooth as he might have hoped. No. So they finish the conspiracy by exclaiming, all for one and each man for himself. <laughs> exactly. After the, the group is dispersed, Edmund and the old man, who hasn't been around very much or said anything much, are sitting by a campfire. Yeah, they're in the forest where black adder is now in a confident mood. And he tells the Morris dancer that no one can stop him now. Not even Philip of Burgundy. Well, I think he says except maybe Philip of Burgundy. Yeah, he does. He's a little bit of a, a haver going on there. Also known as the Hawk. Yes, they were deadly childhood rivals at which point. Well, he was only, yeah, but he was only known as the Thrush back then. Yes, and no one's heard of him for years. So it sounds like Edwin's not sure what happened to him. Yeah, and as Blackadder gets up to leave, the old boy miraculously changes form into a man that Blackadder doesn't recognise. Yes, but once he removes the fake eyebrows... Who is it? It's Philip of Burgundy. The Hawk. And Blackadder wants to confirm it's him because 
Philip of Burgundy did not ride a donkey. <laughs> and the donkey transforms into a much larger horse. <laughs> Blackadder tries to play it cool, but the hawk is for having none of it. And where do we see them next? Well, I think he knocks Edmund out and brings him to a dungeon. Yeah, well, a jail cell. Some kind of cave-based imprisonment room. Where we see our hero being thrown in by his nemesis and being told what the hawk has been up to. And what have you been up to? Waiting, plotting. Nurturing my hatred and planning my revenge. Ah, so you've kept yourself busy. Yes. <laughs> Fifteen years in France teaches a man to hate. Fifteen years of wearing perfume. Fifteen years of eating frogs. Fifteen years of saying pardon. And all because of you. But surely the scenery... I never went outside. I couldn't stand the smell. <laughs> What has all this got to do with me? Because, Edmund, it is going to take you 15 years to die. Fifteen years? Yes. How? I think it might be more amusing if you found out for yourself. Let us just say it has something to do with... Snake. I think if you were remaking this today, Timothy Dalton would make a good Philip of Burgundy. Yes, playing what sort of character from what other show? Well, a bit like he was in Hot Fuzz uh, or Penny Dreadful. Yes, the mustachio twirling bad guy. Ominous looking fellow. Yeah, yeah. does that very well. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Philip's off. Well, we should say before he left we saw him revealing a, a very small collection of snails that terrified Blackadder that was a sort of scream yes. that we heard I wonder how they're going to, to kill him yeah maybe he has to eat them maybe that's what they'll have to eat maybe they're poisoned or maybe they will eat him over time <sighs> really slowly mm. what's the lifespan of the commoner garden snail 347 years that's unfortunate for mm -hmm. anyway with the hawk on his way Blackadder prays for help I think and this is sometime later, isn't it? You kind of get a little fade out. From yeah. Then. He intends to follow the path of the, the very religious saints <laughs> if he is uh, saved by some sort of divine intervention. He's a little bit surprised when the, the Amen at the end of his prayer is uh, echoed. Yes. By whom? Rick Mail. <laughs> Sorry, Mad Gerald. Yeah, Mad Gerald. It's not Rick Mail's finest performance, is it? It's not his, his finest hour, no. We might get to that yeah. later on. He's a wild-looking manic prisoner who has been in the cell for, I think, 20 years. Blackadder asks him if he knows of a, a way out, and after how long of laughing? Quite some time. 12 months. Okay. I don't think it was 12 months really, though. That's just a... Definitely 12 months. Really? Yeah. Okay. I wondered why it felt such a, a lengthy episode. No, that's not the reason. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we do find out a couple of uh, companions that Gerald has in the cave with him. Who are they? Mr. Rat. Mm -hmm. Who else? Mr. Key. What do they make Mr. Key from? His own teeth. Yeah, which Blackadder immediately uses to escape. Yes, but uh, as he runs away, Gerald shouts at him to shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> so we're outside now, and he stops a peasant with a horse and cart who is trying to sell the six black homing pigeons that he has with him. That's not how homing pigeons work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um... Edmund doesn't have enough money for them, but the, the driver jokes about how it would be much cheaper if he just beat and gagged him and tied him to a tree. Yeah, he was a, a very accommodating peasant, wasn't he? He was. He gets beaten and gagged and tied to a tree, <laughs> where Edmund um, then retrieves the birds and rides to the castle. And at the castle, he releases the pigeons and a chicken. Well. <laughs> Which we see find their way to his gang. Yes. And we kind of get a montage -y sort of moment and we skip forward to the group gathering in the castle. We do but I think before that we see the hawk enter the building and draw his sword in anticipation of claiming the throne at ten bells. However as he waits for this the gang does in fact appear from different places followed eventually by Blackadder who had trouble dealing with a wardrobe. He did seem to have a little bit of bother there didn't he? Yeah. He tells the hawk to prepare for death. 
but there's a mutiny on its way. Well, Philip challenges the six men in respect of their choice of leader, and as Edmund lists the qualities that Philip has that he thinks makes him unqualified to lead the group, the other men seem less than persuaded. Yes, it only serves to support his view that the men do indeed think that Hawk would be a, a better chief. Indeed. But rather than die then and there by the sword, the Hawk has other ideas and unveils an interesting cheer. Yeah, the evil men find this very pleasing. They offer a, a round of applause, I believe. For this they day. do indeed. And a little later, Blackadder is now in the chair itself and is being told of the pain that is shortly to befall him. In precisely one minute, the spike will go up your nethers. The shears will cut off your ears. Yes. Then these axes will chop off your hand. And I do not think we need go into the attributes of the cuddling grinder. These feathers here will tickle you under what's left of your arm. And that is the amusing part. <laughs> Gentlemen, let us go and slaughter all the rest of the royal family. God save the king! Because nobody else will! <laughs> There's a surprise in store for the group, however. There is, as they set off on the rampage... They take drinks from some cloaked wenches to toast their enterprise. At least one of them is bearded. <laughs> yeah, but back then, you, know, you didn't have the old uh, lady shaves and what have you, I think. There may be a, a few bearded ladies. That's understandable. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, it's poison wine and they all collapse and die apart from Sean. Yeah, did this remind you of season three a little bit? Season three, which moment? When they poisoned the Scarlet Pimpernel. Okay, yeah, yeah. I get it, yes, because they, they were trying to poison the prison guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sean, um, I think he needed a second dose, or wanted a second dose. Yeah, I think he quite enjoyed the wine. Took a second <laughs> glass and then he too dies. The Wenchies then dance and hug with joy. And we see that it is in fact... Da, 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 it's Percy and Baldrick. Would never have guessed that. No, but unfortunately they've taken so long to celebrate. The next thing they hear is... a anguished scream. Yes, and we find Blackadder on his deathbed sometime later. Well, obviously the chair has activated. Yeah. He's had his nethers impaled and his codling ground and his arms cut off and his oh. ears sliced away I must, and tickled. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's quite harsh, this, for a, for a comedy show. Yeah. You look, you know, very distressed and well, very brutalised. Where did the chair come from? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Who knows? The imagination of Richard Curtis. <laughs> yeah, but why was it in the castle? I, know, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Let's not look at that too closely. In the Great Hall, as you say, Edmund on his deathbed, but attended to by his family. Yes, he is near unconscious and is being looked on by the king, a crying queen and Harry. But the king's voice is so powerful that he manages to waken him from death just by shouting his name. <laughs> and... Blackadder is delighted to realise his father has correctly named him on this occasion. Yeah, I think for the first time, but the king at this Im Im immediately apologises and asks Edgar how he is. <laughs> yeah, I think his, his condition might well be described as terminal at this stage. Yeah, a barely alive Blackadder then asks Harry what his chances are, and he says, good. Not of living, but of going to heaven. <laughs> We get kind of a, a flip back and forth here with Percy and Baldrick who are running through the, the bowels of the castle. Yeah, as the king toasts Edgar, we cut to, to Baldrick and, and Percy and we find out that Percy had poisoned the whole vat of wine or, or whatever drink it was, not, not just, just the, glasses. The, yeah, the black seals got uh, goblets. Oh dear. Back to the hall. They all have a drink. And Blackadder whispers in the king's ear and he obliges with what he thinks his son wants to be called. Can you remember? I didn't catch that one. I think it was the Black Dagger. Oh, right, okay. Before they all collapse to the ground. And die. <laughs> they do, yeah. Blackadder wonders if it was perhaps the wine. So he tries <laughs> a drop himself. Why would you? I mean, uh, suppose in that condition... He's going to die of agony anyway. But he initially doesn't think it was the wine and declares himself king. Yes. At last, before he dies. 
About a second later. Literally seconds later. And that's how we end. Quite a sombre note. Well, there's a wee post credit scene. There is. Where, which is really a continuation, as Baldrick and Percy rush in, shouting, Don't drink the wine! <laughs> Alas. <laughs> They're too late. They're too late. Did you not think they should have finished this series with Henry Tudor coming back? Yes. That, that, made that sense. would have been a nice sort of circular finish, but this, yeah. was, this was okay. So, as a final episode, I mean, I think it's a weird one because, as we mentioned at the start, they sort of ditch most of the, the supporting ca- uh, cast. And I would have thought this type of quest episode might have been better suited to the sort of middle or earlier episodes. Yeah, but if they're going to kill him off at the end, they can't do it earlier. No. Oh, you'd have to change just the ending. Change I just mean so, the, yeah. the fact that they didn't use the the normal list of actors. Fair enough. Mm. Thoughts? It wasn't the worst episode of yeah, the season. Yeah, that doesn't necessarily say much. Yeah, but I do think changing so much probably wasn't the best idea no it just seemed like it wasn't part of the same series almost mm-hmm. also thought that having to gather six people mm-hmm. you didn't it wasn't enough time no well this would have worked maybe better as a christmas special or something like an hour long like after the season yeah a few months later do this as a, like an hour long special yeah you could have done that but yeah overall not the worst but the season as a whole wasn't wasn't top notch no no, like we said, we laid some seeds, some groundwork. Mm-hmm. But. We won't get into it in too much detail where we think it ranks. <laughs> if you have it's to, in the top four. Yeah, certainly. Um, but we can chat about what we thought were the pros and cons of this and the other seasons. I think we'll do a wrap up episode next time. We've got, as I mentioned earlier, black, uh, back and forth. Yes. So after that, we can wrap up the podcast. It'll be the final episode of of that, and we can discuss general bits and bobs, what we're doing next and other things, any such other things. Yeah, yeah really a summation of the experience. Yeah, so we don't have to go into it in too much detail today. Okay. We'll treat it like a normal episode. Yes. With that in mind, I can tell you that this was first broadcast on 20th of July 1983. Now, because of this collection, this gang, I've got to get through about six different people here. Oh dear. <laughs> well, wake me up when you're finished. Okay. I'll try and be quick. John Barrard played the retired Morris Dancer. I've got to say I'm the Hawk, but he obviously didn't play the Hawk. Well, he is the Hawk. Yeah, but no, it's a different actor. Yeah. <laughs> he played the Hawk when he was pretending to be. Yeah. He died in 2013, aged 89. You may have seen him in Santa Claus the movie. The Bill. Sean Show. We'll think of something. Diamonds. If it moves. File it. Mike. Doctor Who from 1964 and Zed Cars. Apparently he declined to take part in the Doctor Who DVD commentary. Maybe he wasn't up to it. Paul Brook played Friar Bellows. He was born in 1944 and has been in the Alan Clark Diaries. Bridget Jones' Diary, The Bill, Doc Martin, Annie's Bar, Ain't Misbehaving, Covington Cross, where he played the friar, Morning Sarge, Kit Curran, and World's End. He's the father of actor Tom Brook, and you may have noticed his distinctive eye. It was a glass eye. Patrick Malahide. I certainly recognised him. He played Guy of Glastonbury, and he was born in 1949. I think for most people, they would associate him with Minder. But he has also appeared in Indian Summers, Game of Thrones, Hunted, Five Days, Alan Mysteries, The Singing Detective, The Pickwick Papers, and The Standard. Sir Wilfred the Death was played by John Hallam. He died in 2006, aged 65. He has been in Flash Gordon, alongside Brian Blessed, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, The Wicker Man, Grange Hill, Emmerdale, EastEnders, Doctor Who from 1989, Casualty, The Malins and Wings. He is the cousin of Casualty actor Clive Mantle. Okay, I know who Clive Mantle is. He was Mm -hmm. in Record of Dibley as well. Was he? He was meant to be, what's his name, Atomic Man or Nuclear Man from Superman 4. Right, but he wasn't. But he wasn't. The Hawk was played by Patrick Allen. He died in 2006, age 79. He appeared in one of my favourite movies, Dial M for Murder. He was also in The Smell of Reeves and Mortimer, Tugs, Roland Rat, Kidnapped, Brett, Crane, Glen Cannon. This is his last of seven Blackadders. 
It was not possible until episode six. Yeah, (laughs) he was in the pilot. When I say he was in the pilot, he is in fact the narrator that we hear in all the episodes in season one. It's a voice that would have been familiar to audiences at the time. Yeah. He is a distinguished voice actor who has performed a lot of uh, public information adverts and has featured on the song Two Tribes by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. <laughs> I think that some of the public information stuff we did was around um, the threat of nuclear attack yes. around about the end of the 70s, start of the 80s. Yeah. Stop, drop and roll. <laughs> he was married to the actress Sarah Lawson. Three Fingered Pete was Roger Sloman. Born in 1946, he has appeared in 176 episodes of EastEnders, Doc Martin, Crossroads, Family Affairs, The Bill, The Tomorrow People, British Empire, Bottom, Rhapsody Nisbet, Bergerac, Spinoff and The Young Ones. And finally, Sean Cook was Sean the Irish Bastard. Born in 1948, you may have seen him in Hot Fuzz, Chocolat, Mr Selfridge, The Diary of Anne Frank, Doctor Who from 2006, The Bill, or The Singing Detective. It's interesting, just going through all those lists, the amount of crossovers with each other and with other members of the cast, there's obviously some kind of connections either being built here or being called on here. Yeah. I I think that the casting agents or producers, whoever is involved now, obviously use the same... If you've worked with someone before, I think, especially if it's a a character actor or a minor part where you're not necessarily the, the star. I think it's uh, it's understandable why you would go to someone who you know can do a job yeah. and you trust. Yeah. Any trivia for us? Well, Rick Mail was also in this, so we mentioned that during of the episode and he was uncredited and... No wonder. I found a quote about why he was uncredited and it makes no sense at all, so see what you make of this. I had my name taken off the credits because I was addicted to this form of performance where the audience thought it was genuinely happening. Uh, now... No idea what you're rambling on about. Yeah, I, I don't know that that works. I don't even know there was an audience for this, particular, unless he meant the television audience. I think that's been a typo. He <laughs> said oh. something else, someone's put it on IMDb <laughs> or wherever it is from. Well, you, you have to say that sort of, if that is your approach, you're doing this sort of method approach yeah. maybe, that you know, it's going to be hit and miss sometimes. And I don't think mm-hmm. this character was his best, but certainly he has done good work in other Blackadder. Certainly episodes. has, obviously. Favourite line this week? Uh, you ride a horse rather less well than another horse would. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I'll go for the king at the end there calling Edmund Edgar. So next time we've got, as mentioned, back and forth. Excellent. Until then. Cheerio. Bye-bye. <laughs>